Welcome to the December 2016 podcast from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. This month, our podcast features abstracts of four scientific articles published in the December issues of the journal, as well as commentaries by Dr. Edward Joseph Harvey on the article entitled, Factors Associated with Increased Healing Time in Complete Femoral Fractures After Long-Term Bisphosphonate Therapy and Dr. Wesley P. Pipitanical on the article entitled Cost Minimization Analysis of Open and Endoscopic Carpal Tunnel Release. Be sure to check out this month's Current Concepts Review article on Neuromuscular Electrical Stimulation Therapy to Restore Quadriceps Muscle Function in Patients After Orthopedic Surgery, a novel, structured approach by Dr. Paul Spector and colleagues. Despite evidence supporting the use of neuromuscular electrical stimulation, NMES, as an adjunct exercise modality to improve voluntary activation, muscle strength, and functional recovery after knee surgery, the authors note that NMES therapy remains a clinically underutilized modality. They propose a criteria-based treatment algorithm aimed at optimizing and simplifying the clinical application of NMES therapy following knee surgery. In addition, they provide practical guidelines for maximizing muscle response while minimizing discomfort and fatigue, including optimal pulse characteristics, electrode size and location, knee joint position, and patient instructions. In this issue, jbjs.org presents a new image quiz, a 48-year-old woman with intermittent groin pain. Be sure to visit us online to access these features, as well as the full text of the scientific articles you are about to discover in the following podcast. Next, you'll hear the first abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled, Factors Associated with Increased Healing Time in Complete Femoral Fractures After Long-Term Bisphosphonate Therapy by Dr. Hei Seong Lim and Associates. Investigation performed at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Samsung Changwon Hospital, Sungkyung Hwang University School of Medicine, Changwon, South Korea. The purpose of this study was to analyze factors that affect healing time after operative treatment of complete femoral fractures associated with long-term use of bisphosphonates. In particular, the authors sought to determine surgically controllable factors related to fracture healing time. 99 consecutive patients who had been surgically treated for a complete atypical femoral fracture were enrolled. All patients had a documented history of bisphosphonate therapy at the time of presentation, with an average duration of 7.4 plus or minus 3.5 years. Baseline demographic data, characteristics of the fracture and surgery, and radiographic findings including femoral neck shaft angle, coronal and sagittal bowing of the femur, and thickness of the femoral cortex were examined. Univariate and multivariate logistic regression analyses were performed to identify predictive factors associated with delayed union or non-union. Of the 109 fractures, 76 showed osseous union within six months after the index surgery and were assigned to the successful healing group. The remaining 33 fractures, which showed delayed union or non-union, were assigned to the problematic healing group. There were differences in body mass index, bisphosphonate therapy duration, and the rate of prodromal symptoms between the two groups. Supraesthetic fracture location, femoral bowing of 10 degrees or greater in the coronal plane, and a lateral medial cortical thickness ratio of 1.4 or greater, were predictive of problematic healing, but were uncontrollable factors. Iatrogenic cortical breakage around the fracture site, as well as a ratio of 0.2 or greater between the remaining gap and the cortical thickness on the anterior and lateral sides of the fracture site, were controllable predictive factors associated with problematic healing. Conclusions Intramedullary nailing without cortical breakage around the fracture site and decreasing the anterior and lateral fracture gaps as much as possible are recommended to reduce healing time in complete femoral fractures associated with long-term use of bisphosphonates. Next. You'll hear a commentary by Dr. Edward Joseph Harvey on the article entitled Factors Associated with Increased Healing Time in Complete Femoral Fractures After Long-Term Bisphosphonate Therapy. This is Dr. Edward Joseph Harvey providing commentary for the December 2016 JBGS podcast. I'll be providing commentary on the article entitled Factors Associated with Increased Healing Time in Complete Femoral Fractures After Long-Term Bisphosphonate Therapy. The title of my commentary is Bisphosphonates Are Not Always Helpful. Somewhere between 20% and 33% of people will sustain an osteoporotic fracture during their lifetime. Preventative treatment has mainly been anti-resorbative therapy such as bisphosphonates. These medications have reduced the risk of fractures in large clinical trials. Unfortunately, prolonged use of bisphosphonates is associated with relatively rare potentially troublesome atypical femur fractures. 
We are just beginning to understand the clinical scenario of atypical femur fractures and develop patient treatment plans. The occurrence of these fractures is still relatively rare for bisphosphonate users. Limital have now evaluated 109 atypical femur fractures in 99 consecutive patients who have been operatively treated for complete atypical femur fractures. These fractures were defined by characteristic radiographic features, including a transverse or short oblique fracture line, medial spike, focal lateral cortical thickening, and no or minimal comminution, according to the criteria of a 2013 American Society for Bone and Mineral Research Task Force. All of the patients had a documented history of bisphosphonate therapy with an average duration of 7.4 years. Baseline demographic data, characteristics of the fracture and surgery, and radiographic findings including femoral neck shaft angle, coronal and sagittal bowing of the femur, and the thickness of the femoral cortex were examined in this cohort. Limitall correctly pointed out that although the precise prognosis is still unknown, there is a growing consensus that the altered bone metabolism caused by long-term use of bisphosphonates would adversely affect bone healing even after osteosynthesis. The later failed fracture healing could be a major concern after fracture stabilization, especially if patients continue to take bisphosphonates. Two or more of these antiresorbent drugs have been sequentially used in just over 10% of the patients. Only six patients took a drug holiday from bisphosphonates for at least one year. Prodromal symptoms developed in 31 fractures, and the mean duration of symptoms was 7 plus or minus 8.5 months. All patients discontinued bisphosphonate medications at the time of admission. Most of the fractures in the current study showed osseous union within six months after surgery. The remaining 30% of fractures revealed delayed union or non-union were assigned to the problematic healing group. This group had differences in body mass index, bisphosphonate medication duration, and the occurrence of prodromal symptoms compared with the patients who healed within six months. Iatrogenic cortical breakage around the fracture site, as well as a ratio of the remaining gap to cortical thickness that was greater than 0.2 on the anterior and lateral sides of the fracture site, were surgeon controllable factors associated with the problematic healing. The problem is that many patients have risk factors that are not surgeon controllable. A varus neck may lead to an atypical femur fracture, and femoral bowing is related to non-union. From the reported results, it appears that left-sided fractures just do not heal properly, reflecting the limited sample size. Limitol believe that higher body mass index, longer bisphosphonate duration, and the presence of prodromal symptoms yielded adverse effects on fracture healing. Although it appears that prolonged use of bisphosphonates and the other two factors may be an issue, the difference is not significant when statistical correction for repeated measures is taken into consideration. The only significant difference that I can see is that these fractures do not heal as well as historical controls, especially those that occur in the subtrochanteric region. It is not hard to understand that these are pathological fractures and need to be treated as such. Most trauma surgeons use cephalomedrine nails to treat these fractures, but it is hard to determine from this manuscript whether there was an accepted gold standard applied. Certainly nailing and distraction, use of circlage wires, or malreduction are not desirable surgical plans. It is impossible from this manuscript to determine what effect the fixation technique had on the outcomes. A larger study with multiple centers and a standardized therapy plan plus bone biopsies is the only way to further clarify solutions to this problem. Next, you'll hear the second abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled Long-Term Restoration of Anterior Shoulder Stability, a Retrospective Analysis of Arthroscopic Banquet Repair versus Open Latterjee Procedure by Dr. Stephan M. Zimmerman and Associates. Investigation performed at the Balgrist University Hospital, Zurich, Switzerland. Various operative techniques are used for treating recurrent anterior shoulder instability, and good midterm results have been reported. The purpose of this study was to compare shoulder stability after treatment with the two commonly performed procedures, the arthroscopic bankert soft tissue repair and the open coracoid transfer according to Latage. A comparative retrospective case cohort analysis of 360 patients who had primary repair for recurrent anterior shoulder instability between 1998 and 2007 was performed. The minimum duration of follow-up was six years. Reoperations, overt recurrent instability, apprehension, the subjective shoulder value, sports participation, and overall satisfaction were recorded. An open ladder shape procedure was performed in 93 shoulders, and an arthroscopic banquet repair was done in 271 shoulders.
Instability or apprehension persisted or recurred after 11% of the 93 Latterjay procedures and after 41.7% of the 271 arthroscopic Bankert procedures. Overt instability recurred after 3% of the Latterjay procedures and after 28.4% of the Bankert procedures. In the Latterjay group, 3.2% of the patients were not satisfied with their result, compared with 13.2% in the Bankert group. Kaplan-Meier analysis of survivorship with apprehension, redislocation, and operative revision as the endpoints documented the substantial superiority of the Latterge procedure and the decreasing effectiveness of the arthroscopic banquet repair over time. 20% of the first recurrences after arthroscopic banquet occurred no earlier than 91 months postoperatively, as opposed to the rare recurrences after osseous reconstruction, which occurred in the early postoperative period with only rare late failures. Conclusions in this retrospective cohort study, the arthroscopic Bankert procedure was inferior to the open Latterge procedure for repair of recurrent anterior shoulder dislocation. The difference between the two procedures with respect to the quality of outcomes significantly increased with follow-up time. Next, you'll hear the third abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled Cost Minimization Analysis of Open and Endoscopic Carpal Tunnel Release by Dr. Stephen Zhang and Associates. Investigation performed at the Stanford University School of Medicine, Stanford, California. Carpal tunnel release is the most common upper limb surgical procedure performed annually in the U.S. There are two surgical methods of carpal tunnel release, open or endoscopic. Currently, there is no clear clinical or economic evidence supporting the use of one procedure over the other. The authors completed a cost minimization analysis of open and endoscopic carpal tunnel release, testing the null hypothesis that there is no difference between the procedures in terms of cost. The authors conducted a retrospective review using a private payer and Medicare Advantage database composed of 16 million patient records from 2007 to 2014. The cohort consisted of records with an international classification of diseases, ninth revision, diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome, and a current procedural terminology code for carpal tunnel release. Payer fees were used to define cost. The authors also assessed other associated costs of care, including those of electrodiagnostic studies and occupational therapy. Bivariate comparisons were performed using the chi-square test and the student t-test. Data showed that 86% of the patients underwent open carpal tunnel release. Reimbursement fees for endoscopic release were significantly higher than for open release. Facility fees were responsible for most of the difference between the procedures and reimbursement. Facility fees averaged $1,884 for endoscopic release, compared with $1,080 for open release. Endoscopic release also demonstrated significantly higher physician fees than open release. Occupational therapy fees associated with endoscopic release were less than those associated with open release. The total average annual reimbursement per patient for endoscopic release was significantly higher than for open release. Conclusions The author's data showed that the total average fees per patient for endoscopic release were significantly higher than those for open release, although there currently is no strong evidence supporting better clinical outcomes of either technique. Next, You'll hear a commentary by Dr. Wesley P. Pipitanical on the article entitled Cost Minimization Analysis of Open and Endoscopic Carpal Tunnel Release. This is Dr. Wesley P. Pipitanical providing commentary for the December 2016 JBJS podcast. I will be providing commentary on the article entitled Cost Minimization Analysis of Open and Endoscopic Carpal Tunnel Release. The title of my commentary is the dilemma associated with the cost of orthopedic surgical care. In the study by Zhang et al., the costs of open and endoscopic carpal tunnel release are compared. The authors report that the overall costs were significantly higher for the endoscopic approach. While there is no strong evidence supporting better clinical outcomes for either technique, this study addresses an important topic regarding the economics associated with a commonly performed orthopedic surgical procedure. In today's ever-changing healthcare environment, there is increasing emphasis on value-based care. The value of a surgical procedure is assessed by relating the clinical benefit to the potential cost. If the clinical benefits of two techniques are equivalent, 
then the more costly procedure is contrary to the concept of value-based healthcare. This can result in a decision-making dilemma for the surgeon with respect to the many conditions for which different operative techniques produce similar outcomes. However, there is some concern regarding the conclusion of Zhang et al. that endoscopic carpal tunnel release costs more with no established clinical superiority. This could be misconstrued by insurance carriers as a justification to deny authorization of or reimbursement for the procedure. As surgeons, we all know that surgical decision-making is a complex, multifactorial process that is rarely black and white. Patient preference and the societal costs for miswork must also be considered. In a randomized controlled trial, Kang et al. found that patients preferred endoscopic to open surgery despite similar outcomes. Patient satisfaction is an important factor in determining successful surgical outcomes. A prospective randomized trial comparing the outcomes and cost of endoscopic and open carpal tunnel release found an earlier median return to work of 20 days with endoscopic release. While a 2015 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found that endoscopically treated patients had an average earlier return to work of 8.7 days. Zhang et al. provide an excellent detailed analysis of various cost centers associated with carpal tunnel care, such as EMG, nerve conduction studies, MRI, ultrasound, and hand therapy. And they found that these costs were not significantly different between open and endoscopic release. While this study attributed most of the difference in costs between the two procedures to facility fees, the more important question of what specifically led to higher costs reported for the endoscopic approach remains unanswered. We can speculate that factors such as the type of facility or the additional equipment requirements of endoscopic treatment could play a role in the cost difference between endoscopic and open carpal tunnel release. The authors acknowledge as a limitation that their database methodology did not allow them to provide more specific details. This study is an important step in understanding the economics associated with endoscopic and open carpal tunnel release. As mentioned in the article, an issue worth exploring in future studies is an analysis of the potential economic gain of an earlier return to work and whether it is enough to compensate for the additional cost of endoscopic release. More information is needed to make a definitive statement regarding the economics of endoscopic and open carpal tunnel release. Next, you'll hear the last abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled Preoperative Prevalence of and Risk Factors for Venous Thromboembolism in Patients with a Hip Fracture, an indirect multi-detector CT venography study by Dr. Wan Chul Shin and Associates. Investigation performed at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Medical Research Institute, Pusan National University School of Medicine, Yangsan, Republic of Korea. This retrospective cohort study investigated the prevalence of and risk factors for preoperative venous thromboembolism, VTE, in patients with a hip fracture and a delay of greater than 24 hours from injury to surgery. This observational study included 208 patients with a hip fracture surgically treated at one university hospital between December 2010 and August 2014. Patients underwent indirect multi-detector computed tomography venography for preoperative VTE detection after admission. Overall VTE risk and median time from injury to CT scan were calculated. Age, sex, fracture type, time from injury to CT scan, body mass index, pre-injury mobility score, previous anticoagulation treatment, previous hospitalization for VTE, varicose veins, and medical comorbidities were considered potential risk factors. The prevalence of preoperative VTE was 11.1% including 12 patients with deep vein thrombosis alone, 7 patients with pulmonary embolism alone, and 4 patients with both. 
The mean time from injury to CT scan was 4.9 days. The delay from the time of injury to CT scan averaged 7.6 days for patients who developed preoperative VTE, compared with 4.2 days for patients who had not developed VTE. In the adjusted models, female sex, subtrochanteric fracture, pulmonary disease, cancer, previous hospitalization for VTE, and varicose veins were risk factors for VTE. The final multivariate logistic regression analysis demonstrated that female sex, subtrochanteric fracture, pulmonary disease, and previous hospitalization for VTE increased the risk of VTE. Conclusions The authors' findings show a high prevalence of preoperative VTE in patients with a hip fracture. Therefore, preoperative investigation for VTE should be routinely considered for patients in whom surgery is delayed for more than 24 hours. At this time, indirect multi-detector computed tomographic venography seems to be effective and useful. Thank you for listening to this JBJS podcast. Please visit www.jbjs.org for commentary and perspective on many of the articles presented in this podcast and for more content of interest.